Good afternoon, everyone. Good evening in some places. Welcome to Black Center of Poetry Reading. I'm Dr. Shaki Jackson. I'm a social psychologist in Los Angeles County, and I'm also a poet. Two months ago, my friend and colleague, Dr. Natalie Graham, who is also a poet, mentioned that she wanted to share living poetry with her intermediate creative writing class. Um, it's a daunting task, if you know Dr. Graham, because she's organizing, she's teaching, planning, negotiating, and she's collaborating over at CSU Fullerton. She asked me if I knew anyone who might want to curate a reading that could provide like a range of poetry, craft, and innovation, and I volunteered. And I'm really grateful that Natalie gave me the chance to curate this experience. So it's been my pleasure in the last month to kind of walk around and figure out exactly who I wanted to share this experience. And I try to, I look at my shelves. Um, I go through all of those 100 tabs that we say that we're gonna read and we might get to like two or three if we're fancy. Um, I just wanna think about which poets I build my home with and that's who I wanna share with you. So as I was going through this exercise of just considering who might be great to share with students, I thought of a video game designer and photographer and poet Keith Wilson, um, whose photography is actually on my wall. And I thought of Nabila Lovelace, who once read a poem that was so dope at the Writers' Conference that I actually have a bootleg recording on my cell phone. Sorry, Nabi. Uh, I also thought of, um, I thought of Ty. I thought of public school teacher and former motorcycle rider, Ty Freedom Ford. Um, whose broadside is sitting over my right shoulder. So anytime I'm in a Zoom meeting, people can actually read Thai over my shoulder, which is great. And I thought of instructor and donut connoisseur, Philip B. Williams, who's a very generous instructor and mentor, and he's um, a very loving brother. So these are the people who I want to share with you today. Their work is it's textured, it's inhabitable, it's energizing, um, and it's very meaningful to me. So I'm glad that they could all be here today from coast to coast. Throughout the reading, I'm going to read their biographical statements so that you know who is about to read. Um, and then Dr. Graham is going to help me by dropping the links to each of our readers' books in the chat. So what's really important is that you all um, if you decide that you want to purchase the book, is that you support small presses, um, that you avoid Amazon as much as possible. They don't need your money, but other small bookstores do. So make sure you're paying attention to the chat, copy and paste links, make sure that you can get your hands on these books. All right, many thanks to Dr. Graham and today's guests, including Tommy Blount, Nandi Comer, Ty Freedom Ford, Luther Hughes, Nabila Lovelace, Joy Priest, Philip B. Williams, and Keith S. Wilson for lending a hand today. Let's get to the work. I'm going to ask all of our guests to turn off their cameras so that we can give the screen to our first featured writer, Tommy Blount. Oh, am I going? Not yet. I want to introduce you, if I may. But look at that face. I haven't seen that face in years. Oh. Hi. I've missed Hi, you. Hi, friend. Hi. Yeah. I've missed you. It's been a long time. Yeah, yeah the math. The math yeah. is hard. Yeah. So everyone, born and raised in Detroit, Tommy Blount is the author of Fantasia for the Man in Blue from Four Way Books, a finalist for the National Book Award, and the chat book What Are We Not For by Bull City Press. He lives in Novi, Michigan. I present to you, Tommy. I'm so, wait a minute, hold on, damn it. Okay, 
I'm so happy that I'm going first because then I can sit back and relax and listen to everyone else. Um, so, mm, yes, thank you with Shaki and Natalie for um, putting this together. I'm so geeked to be reading with all of these brilliant, fantastic, beautiful poets. Um, yeah, it's been like one of the, the things I've been looking forward to, so. All right, I know, five minutes, I know, I know, I know. So apparently I locked myself into this, um, this theme of um, fashion. So I've been obsessed with like, not necessarily trends in fashion, but like the history around fashion and there's different you know, stories around fashion. And one of those places that it's taken me to is the work of Richard Avedon, um, whom we know went to high school with James Baldwin and they collaborated on a project. And um, in that project is a photograph called um, The Generals of the Daughters of the American Revolution, 1963. And it's this beautiful, ironically enough, it's this beautiful photograph because it's Richard Avedon, it's this beautiful photograph of these very horrible women who um, a few years prior denied uh, Marian Anderson the stage at Constitution Hall. And yeah, so Avedon took this photograph and in the photograph, they're all like in different states of posture and they're not paying attention. And it, some of them look smug and, you know, like, oh, I'm just above all of this. So, um, so yeah, so I was, so when I was thinking about this photograph, um, I was thinking about that old, um, <laughs> that old problematic thing of, I don't see color or, you know, I'm colorblind. So I wanted to write a poem in which color appears, but not as a color, not as colors. Um, I'm gonna take some water. I wish I'd applied my chapstick before this. Mm, mm, mm. All right, five minutes. The Generals of the Daughters of the American Revolution, 1963. Redolent of another era, witless to what comes next, the women hide their hands in blued gloves as long as there is a past too murky to be plumbed. Clean sashes slash over so many loud, old, ornate doors, each one too stuck for even Avedon to open up. Round, are they not without a wit of decorum? He golds them into a corner of the Mayflower Hotel where they yell over each other in hushed tones. Each flush a study of light and shadow. They are too enraptured with themselves to learn how to notice what's colored in all around them. Weighed down in regalia fit for the purple, a marooned monarchy. The daughter's mother wrinkles from their gowns, marry their faces back. So this will be my second and last poem. Um, so speaking of fashion, right. So part of my obsession with fashion ended up in my book um, in several places, but most noticeably in the poem Framing Deborah Shaw. And um, yeah, let me see if I can do this really quickly. So Deborah Shaw was, um, is a supermodel. She's a fantastic supermodel, I love her. Um, she was a frequent collaborator with Alexander McQueen. And in 1997, I think she appeared in one of his shows um, in which he wanted her to wear this sort of odd piece of jewelry. And um, when he first presented it to her, she's like, this reminds me of like manacles and like collars and, you know, slave collars and stuff. And um, and there's a video of her, she ends up walking in. So he ends up talking her into it. And there's a video of her walking in it. And I just still 
it's just still so, like, I don't know how to feel about it. So I wrote a poem um, in the voice of a fashion critic who may or may not believe what he's saying. Framing Deborah Shaw, and it begins with an epigraph from Deborah Shaw. I felt as if my body was in a picture frame. A simple mass of angles, really. Nothing too fussy, a square. Soldered at each corner, a ring, sound design. Just thin enough not to be confused for shackles. There are no chains. Little bangles to meet her biceps, garter her strong upper thighs. See, there is room for her to slip out of them if she chooses. McQueen asked, she had a choice, okay? Okay, okay. She was made aware of the frame, open to opening the show to show, McQueen said. Aryan notions of beauty are ridiculous. So why not open her body as the entryway, her walk barely a walk, an animal scuttle. Just does she even feel it when her thighs pedal her down the steps? Is there an ache? Her soul slosh the runway filled with black water. It isn't that deep, a tributary to hop across or a mouth open to trouble the hound eyed camera sniff for the smell of genius. Everyone claps for her or not for her, the simple black mesh dress, it's beaded fringe. How as graceless as she appears, she manages not a rip or tear. Isn't it a miracle? McQueen's folly, his imagination, a savagely dark and beautiful thing. Thank you. Thank you so much for fashion and for seeing color and for your acrostic this Tommy. We appreciate you. Next up is Nandi Comer. Nandi, you can turn on your camera when you're ready. Nandi Comer, a proud Detroiter, is the author of Tapping Out and American Family a Syndrome. Her poems and essays have appeared in Crab Orchard Review, Green Mountains Review, The Offing, and South Southern Indiana Review. Please welcome Nandi. Hi. Hello, hello. Um, I just want to first say uh, thank you particularly to Natalie and to Ashaki for like coming to me with one of the most exciting reading lists that I've seen this year. Everyone here today, I absolutely love your work and I love being in this room with you. And then I also wanna say thank you to all of the students and all the attendees today for coming. Um, so even if you're here on assignment or if you're here because you love poetry, I say thank you to you all for coming and listen to some poems. I'm gonna read some, um, poems from uh, my most recent collection, Tapping Out. And just to give you all just a quick introduction, um, the book is has a lot of poems about Mexican wrestling, hence this cover of this luchador. Um, but it's not just about that. So I thought I'd give you a sampling of that. I won't stop in between, just know, um, yeah, just three poems. So great match. There's a quote from Ray Mysterio. You think to yourself, take it easy, I'm giving you my body. Of course, you don't say that, you suck it up. Ray Mysterio. After the match, say thank you, or nice work out there, or my God, where'd you get those moves? Don't lose your balance, don't topple, gather your body like a sack of cramped muscle and bones. Though your arms are drag, like a ton of ground meat, keep your fists extended through the air, soft punch the others, wiggle a two or three step dance as if you've just sprung into the ring. Don't talk about your knees, cartilage, or that you're afraid of the unraveling sounds crackling through your shoulders. Each time you springboard from the third rope, 
even if your neck opens and your head hangs by fibrous threads, say thank you. Great match. So a lot of people think that it's fake. So I had to write some poems about pain. Um, and this poem, a lot of people think about the mask wrestlers. So I think a lot about the wrestlers and when they lose their mask. So I wrote a poem in kind of dedication of that moment when you lose your mask. It's in two voices um, between the fighter, el luchador, and la mascara, the mask, el luchador. When the laces loosened and gave a cool air and calm hit my face, the ring's grass clogged my ears. Not silent, not chaos. It was as if I'd mangled my hand on the job. I lost my face, placed my creased grin into my audience's palms. Losing my mask was like having my torso ripped out. Then I offered it, still trembling to the winner, my face my exposed veins pumping over my forehead. I was no lazy factory worker losing my thumb under a negligent power saw. Not a chef cutting too quickly at a raw carrot. I lost. I put on a good face, my face. I dragged the rest of my body through the arena, through warm back halls to my locker, pulled my arms into my shirt and tugged at the buckle of my belt. I dressed my body in plain clothes. I broke to La Mascara. Before I let go, before they part me open, before they pull you head first out of me and hand me over to a man who will take me and hang me, before I become a sparkling medallion, a memory, a relic of slaughter, you have to loosen all the strings. You will always have hair, boots, and tape, and in a year, you can go to a mall or grocery store. You can walk in through the dust of a market, and everyone will know the bottom lip and callous forehead I have kept so long inside. Mijo, before I let go of your face, someone will have to rip me apart. And then the last one is more, just so y'all know, it's not all about wrestling. I do write about personal things, even though wrestling is pretty personal with me. How not to lose the mask. Take down the man who grabs your crotch while on your way to church. This actually happened, but I had to write about it. When bells swing through the soft devotional clang, when you are near and can recognize pastel flowers ruffled in a girl's church dress, you will pass the stubby man, your opponent. You might take him for another worshiper or merely a drowsy morning pedestrian. When he reaches his thick arm towards you, you may not realize what he's aiming for. You might not understand until he seizes you, until you're already caught in his dirty fat hand and spun the both of you so that now you face each other. You might blurt out, hijo de tu puta madre, and pendejo, and mierda, Summon every curse word you can remember. You might be too far for any priest to notice your assault. Make the most of this match. Twist his arm at the wrist. If you can, an elbow bend. The struggle might feel like a lifetime, but let's face it, your grip has never held on long. So keep cursing. Do not stutter. See how his startled eyes roll open. Call his file. Repeat, pinche, cabron. When he loosens your grip and takes off running, chase him, that's allowed. You might not even follow him for blocks. Even if you stay planted in your tiny square of sidewalk, keep cursing, call him pendejo again. Thank you. That was remarkable. Thank you so much, Nandi. And if you all are lucky enough to get this book, um, there are some really, wonderful images. I don't know if you all can see it very well um, by, I believe it's Miguel Valverde. Miguel Valverde, Valverde yep. That's him. And these images are just like these beautiful, elegant brush strokes of um, luchador strategy. I suppose I don't know all of the moves. I wish I did, but I do want to thank Nandi for um, luchador strategies as well as sounds of the body. Um, that third poem was really 
an experience. I found myself holding my breath. So thank you again. All right, next up we have Thai Freedom Ford. You are welcome to turn on your camera at any time. A 2019 Jerome Hill Artist Fellowship Inaugural Fellow, Ty Freedom Ford is the author of two poetry collections, How to Get Over from Red Hen Press and And More Black from Augury Books, winner of the 2020 Lambda Literary Award for Lesbian Poetry. She also has a chat book that I first met her over. I won't talk about the, the title of it, but I still have that chat book here. Maybe you can just look at the title. No, it was good. It was good. This is where we start. Start from the bottom, now we're here. Um, Ty lives and loves in Brooklyn, where she is an author and editor at No Dear Magazine. Please welcome Ty Freedom Ford. Hey guys, what's up? Thank you, Ashaki. Thank you, Natalie. Thank you to all my co-poets and presenters. Y'all are so dope. I really, really, really like adore you guys all. I was just like, I couldn't believe that I was asked to be a part of this like star-studded uh, group of readers. So I'm super honored to be here. Um, yeah, so I'm just gonna, I'm gonna read three poems uh, from the book um, and I'll just say, um, a lot of, so there, there are sonnets in the book. It's com, com, comprised of sonnets and some of the, a lot of the sonnets, sonnets are uh, ekphrastic and based on um, the work of black artists. So I'll start with, um, I'll start with this poem uh, that is after an artist named Jacoby Satterwhite who is, he, it's funny because he's, he's blowing up now, but I actually like knew him when he was a little kid. Uh, I used to be friends with his older brothers when we lived in Atlanta. Um, so it's really cool to see him or them like kind of blow up and be amazing on the art scene. And um, I was watching a video and in the video, he said, the body that I'm performing in doesn't understand limits. So that's the title of the poem after Jacoby Satterwhite. Barbecue teeth, meaning charge so black it's white. Barbie thieves the subconscious skin, knee, skim milk and silk do rags, drags queen the river neon pink and luscious. Fag hags, straight as cigarettes, but curvy as birds named precious. Praise what the geometry suggests. Hands masturbating circumference, what choice but succumb. Become friends, eat each other down to the white meat, what choice but suck. Come, become dominion of sequins. What is femininity if not pageantry? A pantry of days of the week panties. Which way is Tuesday? And which is the rudest way to say unicorn porn besides this poem? Audition for the bed. Touch, don't touch yellow elbow, fluorescent moon, new moon, sleep, sleepless, red eye, snore, don't snore, slob, don't slob, hair, no hair, brown pussycat, hairless, boxes, no panties, black dodo, breath, Breathless, scratch, don't scratch. Rough, not rough, pink fingernail. Hard, hardly, ashen foot, don't lick. Lick, kiss, don't kiss, don't tell. Tell, hurry up, slow down. Dark mouth, there, right there, not now, 
now. Blue kneecap, don't dream, dream, scream, shh, light, no light, golden hair, good night, no night, fight, don't fight, purple lip, layover, no flight, flight, green eye, cry, don't cry, wetness, dry, don't wait, wait, flail, don't flail, pale armpit, handcuffs, peach thigh, dive, don't dive, drunk, drink, think, don't. And the last poem uh, is uh, after a, an artist named Ellen Gallagher. Uh, and as a part of her practice, she makes these like paper wigs. Um, so one day Ellen Gallagher will make paper wigs for our wedding day. I hold all my funk in my mouth, armpit and cooch, dyke dowry, decanter of scotch, mason jar of homemade hooch. What's your pleasure? Scour me with lavender, lather me in shea butter, palm roll my locks, gather my best words into books, open your palms, let me unlock all that you secret a hush inside, your hands ferment to palm wine. Let us drink and lie upon a kalim woven with our fur. Fingertips fiery with saffron, blue from indigo, dyed with the beet sweet blood of our undoing. Let our ribs be the loom, make wool of this skin, cotton of this hair, warp and weft, Love will doom what's left of us. Thank you. We need a minute. We need a minute. I'm so glad that this webinar has everyone on mute just at the moment because I assume that there was a variety of howling and sighs with some praise, like there was excitement in that work and a little sweat. There's a little sweat there. Thank you, Ty. I, I always enjoy meditations on black as a color, as a genre, as the rhythm, but I'm learning that black is always is also like a geometry and a way to love. So Wow, yeah, I'm gonna introduce the next person. And I'm gonna get a sip of water so that I can recoup so that we can get through this reading, but thank you. Ooh, so much for that. Um, let our ribs be the loom. Y'all heard that. Yeah, y'all heard that. Okay. Next, I would like to introduce featured reader, Luther Hughes. Luther, you may turn on your camera when you are ready. Luther Hughes is the author of A Shiver in the Leaves and the chat book, Touched. He is the executive editor at The Offing and one third of the Poet Salon podcast with Gabrielle Bates and Duji Tahat and founder of Shade Literary Arts, a literary organization for queer writers of color. Before I start, I want to make sure that I did not ruin that person's name. Luther, can you tell me the um, co-founders of the Poet Salon so that I can correct any errors in my pronunciation? No, you had it. Yeah, Gabrielle Bates and Duji Tahat. Yes, Duji Tahat. Respectfully. Wonderful. Thank you so much for being here with us, Luther. I yield the floor to you. Um, I want to say thank you so much to Shaki and Natalie for doing this. As everyone would have said, this is like an all-star reading, and I feel so um, honored to be a part of this wonderful reading, seeing all these beautiful Black people and hearing their work, who I admire um, oh, so, 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 so much. Um, 
So I'm going to be reading just one poem. Um, and this poem is going to be from my forthcoming debut collection of poems, um, A Shiver in the Leaves. Mercy. Peeking through the clouds, Mount Rainier with its white tank top, several cities to glare upon and a more a blue sky to angle into, must love by now to be American. When asked this by the woman in front of us, on the night President Obama was elected, my mother and I in Walmart, isn't it a great night to be American? The cashier just nodded, but my mother yelled, yes, it really is, thank God. And yes, yes, it was a great night to be American. There, between the bags of lays and plague of batteries, to be Black in America, thank God. But, oh, mountainous beast, who am I to think now, years later, walking home from the bus stop? surrounded by midwinter eaten trees and new rise condos that my love wasn't shot by cops at work today mistaken as someone else is there a song for this strain of mercy at home the light flickers above us as we sip wine letting the tv wash our bodies into quiet laughter I know we should spend this time spitting on the name of America how we usually do when another black person has been killed or when another country perfumes with our war, but there's beauty unaccounted for tonight. There are crows out back, tired from the work of flights and pilgrimage, ashing the branches one by one, there is the crock pot of red beans in the kitchen, its chestnut chest bubbling with bay leaves and sausage. I fear I have made a mess of being an American. Love, I'm dumb with the fear of never doing enough. Is there anything else you want to say about what happened today? I ask him as he takes a spoonful of home into his mouth. The laugh track on TV peppers the room and he shakes his head. What did I expect him, black like me, American like me, in love like me, to say after dusting the day along to get inside this four-walled pasture amid the morning of dirty laundry? the painting of a cracked moon guarding the wooden black dresser. Do you like the food? He asks. Yes, I do, I say. And I kiss him on the cheek. Thank you. Thanks, y'all. That was fantastic. I so appreciate the many variations of hunger and feeding in your work, Luca. I do want to take a moment um, because I did not mention this at the beginning that some of the poems may not be suitable for younger audiences, specifically children. So it is up to your discretion whether or not you would like your children to listen in to the remainder of this reading. Um, and now I would like to invite Nabila Lovelace to the screen. Nabila Lovelace is a first-generation Queens-born poet. Her people hail from Trinidad and Nigeria. Son of Achilles, her debut book of poems is out now through Yes Yes Books. Please welcome Nabila Lovelace. Hey y'all, how's it going? Um, Luca, that poem. Uh, I love I love that poem. Thank you and. Thank you to everyone uh, to be able to be on this 
and be a part of this reading is a, a real dream. Um, I look up to, to everyone's work on here. And so I just have so much gratitude. Um, I'm gonna get into the poems, you know. <laughs> I'm just gonna get into the poems. Um, so I'm gonna read uh, three poems. I'll start with this first one. Um, and I'm just, you know, quickly thinking about what Ashaki said. There's, you know, language. Yep, here we are. Okay, uh, fittest. I am faster than you and that is why I survive. Before, my skin was all marked bills, traced and tracked in a computer, easily located and thrilling. Hair follicles, 75% cotton, 25% linen. Now, I got blood for sale. I'll never go broke. In this economy, plasma guarantees me at least three of me. I'm a good woman for my nigga. Learn to read last and still outread you. I can mark things too. My hymen was a gentleman previous to bleeding through king-sized mattresses. If beds were my husband's, they'd be fixed. Ages 11 through 14, I bled through every pair of jeans on the regular and marked so much land. Okay, um, and so I'm gonna get into uh, this next one, which uh, is called, When We See Us. Hair rollers set under what oven doors pack, strands of coiled bounty bound to heat. Real gold won't flatten till 2000 degrees, so make it hot, real, Hot girl shit, hot girl summer. I've drawn in my peacock feathers raising with each step on the block. My moo moo wafting in the wind glitters catching skin light like the sun's wink. Every she cross-legged in the salon, glass window is front and length is ceiling to floor for the jaw drop of their sweat. I pass the salon to say what up to Poppy at the bodega and start my dollar and part my dollar snapple from its encased brethren. Poppy knows me and my cotton, my mane half done, half platted down ears of corn, half stood as unhacked weeds at attention. My cousin whole yelling not to go out there with my hair like that. My man's dawdles his mountain bike close to the kind of nature that is paved over. This being how I learned love. Concrete, my knees in gravel beds, taking road into the home. My skin unpeeling to its white meat like a potato and still timed every store run for the unspiral of roller sets. Curls a buoyant wave of shimmer, catching every metal surface, jealous of this kind of gleam, glamour, unbound to gravity. Um, all right, and then uh, just one more poem. This will be my last poem. I wanna thank y'all again so much. Uh, thank you, Ashaki, for your organizing. Thank you, thank you so much, Natalie. Uh, I just, I have so much gratitude to be here. Thank y'all. Um, this last one is called Shame, My Wife and My Murderer. Unwanted, you are the table in the room of my mind. You are the wires in the wall booming through the speaker system. When I offered you VBSs, you requested emerald cut canaries. From your cave came speech. From where you killed me is wet with desire. You mighty root system, the oak that connects my other oaks. Head bitch, queen bee, you make and are the honey. When I bowed to you, it made stallion knees rust. When I licked you, brackish water appeared in my tongue's moat. We made love like underwater, like time was a night moth sneaking a porch moon. I fed you to my veins and what should run calcified. My friends said you are not my friend, but I kept you my bedraggled tooth, my steamboat coal oven. You be the soot and the well drying out. Thank y'all so much. I love it. I love when things come together. 
I love when I can't breathe because the poetry is so overwhelming and I decided to go back and see the last time I bootlegged a recording <laughs> of your poetry and it's right here and it says um March 28th 2019 and that's when I was first like Nabila Lovelace that's the first it says Nabila but there's like five I's and five A's and will I ever delete this probably not no 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 so thank you so much for biology what else did I hear I heard the musicality in your work I heard place like we were in the salon vernacular the knees gravel potatoes black hair like you brought it all, what a gift, what complexity in your gift. I'm so touched that you were able to be here with us today. Thank you. Don't worry, I didn't record it on my phone this time. I'm just gonna steal this whole recording for myself. <laughs> Thank you so, so much. Okay, next up, next up. Oh, it just keeps getting better. What's going on here? Um, we have Joy Priest. Joy, you may join us via camera when you are ready. Joy Priest is the author of Horsepower, winner of the Donald Hall Prize for Poetry. She is the recipient of the 2020 Stanley Kunitz Prize, and her poems have appeared or are forthcoming in the Academy of American Poets Poem A Day, American Poetry Review, and The Atlantic, among others. Her essays have appeared in Bitter Southerner, Poets and Writers, ESPN, The Undefeated, and A Measure of Belonging, 21 Writers of Color on the New American South. She is currently a doctoral student in literature and creative writing in my hometown at the University of Houston. Welcome, welcome, Joy. Yeah, like this isn't fair. I have to go after Nabila and um and y'all kind of got me a little um teary. Um, but I promise I'm more uh honored by this company than anyone else here. And um just really grateful for the spirit that is Ashaki. Um I've been reading from the book a lot, so I just decided today to try some new things like you know, with, you know, we're all on Zoom a lot. So um, I hope it doesn't disrupt this like very tender, um, quiet sort of low register that I feel the reading has been in. Um, but, you know, I just was, I was thinking today about how music has gotten me, uh, carried me through this year in many points of my life. And it's number two after poetry for me. Um, so I'm gonna share a couple of things with sound sound and music in them. Uh, this past year, I got the opportunity to, um, I got the opportunity to, to do a fellowship with, uh, with other artists, visual artists, and um, one of them, uh, also happened to Moonlight as a DJ and producer. And so we were just kind of messing around one night talking about Curtis Mayfield. And he just sort of like, you know, uh, whipped a sample up in like 20 seconds and sort of, you know, like I was freestyling to it. And he said, hey, I got to send this exhibit off on Wednesday. Um, but if you write something to it, it was like Sunday night. If you write something to it, give it to me by tomorrow. Um, it can go with the, with the piece. Um, so I went back and wrote this poem um, and he, he ended up finding this like old uh, vintage panel speaker right here uh, and, and, and wiring it through the piece. So uh, it was crazy and I was, I was just really uh, happy to be a part of it. So this is what we made. Let me actually optimize the sound. I'm really sorry about that. Okay, all right. In that duck yellow Catalina, our hearts fluttered like tweeters. 
We sat between the elbows of men behind us, a trunk full of speakers. Our uncle ciphered the block with no destination in mind, politicking with everyone, the street's sage monk speakers. Twice a day they stopped at the executive lounge, old men in dark glasses leaned drunk against speakers. We had dreams named after us there, too young to drink. We sat silent, swayed to the funk of the speakers. Back in the car, our uncles whistled at women, and we learned to read lips over the thump of the speakers. They stopped in alleys and parking lots, dropped their hands out the windows, doing business, selling, junk to the tweakers. In the mornings, they jackhammered asphalt and red clay. In the evenings, still vibrating, they gathered, woofing like the subs of a speaker. In truth, they worked a gang of jobs. The union was their set. All they had to show was the rattle and jump of the speakers. Inside, our grandfathers played treble man on repeat. Skillet cornbread crackled like torn lump speakers. Our mothers, home from work, called us in from outside. The hair on our cheeks, the soft mesh that housed the bump of our speakers. Okay, and this other piece, um, this, this, I should say this semester or recently I had the, uh, I was just lucky to be able to be in a workshop with Francine J. Harris and the workshop was really just a study uh, on sound. So that's also kind of why I'm in this, this place right now. But uh, one of the things that uh, I've been trying to do is learn how to play bass and, um, and I finally got an opportunity to do that. I finally got into it this year, like in all of this, the solitude, you know, and um, I really just love that instrument because I, I, there's a small delight I have when I see like a woman playing the bass. And um, I don't know, it just feels kind of like a protest against, you know, it just feels like an instrument that, you know, in these gender roles, like isn't, a, a woman's instrument or, you know, I've been told that as well in my interest when I was younger and I was interested in playing it. So it just kind of feels like a protest against like femininity or what femininity is supposed to be. Um, and so when I started learning to play it, um, I discovered this mnemonic um, that just sort of encapsulated everything I love about the instrument. Um, and, uh, the, you know, the strings uh, on it are E, A, D, G, and the mnemonic is uh, Eva ate dynamite good. So this is a protest poem. Eva ate dynamite good, like a tear gas brigade on a runaway night. Her genre, black meadow. Her sound, maroon. Her imitators pale as any clout in the verso world. Eva already done got down. Eva already done got it worked out like a remedy for terror in our new carceral courtyard. My favorite little agitator, my pluck, my thread of mine. Eva ain't dim gas. Eva ain't devil ain't dust, always dropping goods. Eva always grieving drums. Goodness gracious, Eva ate. Eva ate. Eva ate dynamite good. Eva armed defense garland, departed genealogy, escort, sliding notes, paraffin, fret fingers, Eva ate doggone. All right, that's, that's all I had. Thank y'all so much. It's like you're leaving us too soon. I'm still, I'm still trying to put the tears back in my eyes from the first video because that collaboration was smooth. Wow, thank you so much for, for multimedia, for showing us the dimensions of poetry. That was beautiful. And after a month 
of waiting, who finally got horsepower. Looking forward to crack into, cracking into this this weekend. Thank you so much, Joy, for being here with us. That was just, yeah. All of our plans to catch our breath during this reading, go ahead and throw those out. We good, we good. All right, we are coming upon our last two readers, even if your emotions can't handle it. Philip B. Williams is next up. Philip, you may join us by camera when you are ready. Philip B. Williams is from Chicago, Illinois, and author of the book Thief in the Interior from Alice James Books, a recipient of the Kate Tufts Discovery Award, the Whiting Award, and Radcliffe Fellowship. He currently teaches at Bennington College and the Randolph College Low Residency MFA. Please welcome my brother, Philip Williams. Hey, Shaki, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, good, good. Uh, I need a break. <laughs> I need a break. Everybody's been so good. It was a lot. Oh, everyone's been so great. It's been good to see everyone. Um, oh, Joy, that was beautiful. That was, I teared up uh, the first piece and I don't usually do that. So who's that? Uh, I'm going to read two poems from um, a new, a new project that I'm working on called Mutiny. Um, the premise of which is just working on final, what are called final poems, poems that uh, use a trope that is common in my poetry, or perhaps poetry at large, and try to uh, say goodbye to them in no particular way. Final poem for the deer. Deer asleep on the side of the road, no. Dear, dead there as always, preserved in the book of symbols. Dear with its flies and uncanny arrows in its sides, like compass needles or fleshless wings. Dear whose hooves puncture names in the snow. Dear who knows your name. Dear a white-tailed Gnostic in the woods. Dear you get lost in. Dear with the ribbon of brass bells around its neck and an iron sword in its antlers altar. Dear emperor watching a funeral from afar like a crack in the vagaries of the mouth that wanted a deer to live, but instead got a pet decorated and for the having. Deer in the mind taking place of the deer was always its assignment. Here, the casket carrying the father is a deer. Four cloven hooves upon the red carpet, a blown up photograph of the father's past face, a road sign saying the future is still. Boy who refuses to view his body's father, afraid of the face he will not recognize, for addiction has its way with flesh. Dear casket marching out the church to where the earth is gentler to flesh, strips it patiently. Dear carrying the dead in its spine cradle, the scent of pears beckons from the bassinet of bone, the dead carrying the dead, the arrows in the deer tremble toward their cardinal affairs, the skin someone forgot the feel of, the mama who never said goodbye, the daddy whose belly rolled on its side like a truck hit deer, there is no daddy here. The father sits up in his coffin, startled, his funeral full of his sons, which is the one son repeating like a paper cutout, the forest of sons in which the deer tilts its head into the father's grave and sips. Final poem for the moon. My first lover, my clavicles chiseler sculpting me into blue lamentation and crucible for your lunacy. Summon me to scuttle forward, cancer moon, cancer rising, and feel myself on your dust flashed milk, your grayscale honey, black green grasses sharpen their night blades with. My paramour who gowns me in a yawning glint, heliosis canvas by which you find your aspects, find your shape mishappen in seven eighths, your eighth self finally filled with ochre blood or the ruddy salutations of familiar fever. You pass your sickness to me like fervor, my heart a moon learning all its phases at once. My idiolect and diaphragm, deliberate disc slipped from tough spine, Elysium I pitch my body beneath, white morning glories opening from my sweat flushed back. 
I feel my veins heart pluck toward you. I rise like any body of water compelled into risk, pulled up the god ladder of your gibbous. You perfect your appetite in my blood, hematite of harvest, scolocyte that pulls my blood waves to zenith in your skull of good omen, your lambent weight witness to worship and worry. I, a sun celibate celebrant ensconced in pearl, my moon travels in your fingerless hand. I dance loot backed in the armory of your niveous eye, your snake fang posture I hang from my ear your crescent weaning me off your nectar. I will grieve your circumference, your diameter, your secant and cord as you renew yourself with erasure. Moon as a mouth no more. Moon as a wound no more. Moon wound round my fist no more. Moon in the grips of hunger. Moon chipped tooth. Goat eye round in shock no more. Moon no beast aspires to kiss. Moon, the color of my coming no more. Misery moon, moon dipped in a whale. Moon sick no more. Moonward, dust floats but lingers no more. Moon heavy chimney no more. Moon washed tongue washing me no more. Full moon night's chandelier no more. How high the no more moon. The cow jumps over the never moon. Moon river no more. Wider than a mile. My arms take the shape of you no more. Do not watch me while I look for you in the galaxy that breathes your many names. Sukuyomi, Koyoshaki, Shangu, Kansu. I am malazed by moon glut, moonstruck, lunatic, eclipsed by my lips, supplicant. Oh. All right, thank you. Oh. <laughs> Oh, you just danced over consonants and slant rhymes, and you took the master's words and you, you threw it back in the master's face, and the master didn't know what to do with it. I love the musicality. <laughs> oh, you're so good at this. Thank you, thank you. This is like a, an early Chris McQuanzica gift for me. It's mine now. It all belongs to me. Thank you. <sighs> Last but not least, I would like to welcome Keith Wilson to the screen. Keith S. Wilson is an Afrolatian poet and a Cave Canem Fellow. He is a recipient of an NEA Fellowship, an Elizabeth George Foundation grant, and has received both a Kenyan Review Fellowship and a Stegner Fellowship. Please welcome my friend, Keith. Thank you, thank you. Uh, yeah, thanks to Shaki and to Natalie. This, oh my God, this lineup. Uh, yeah, this is making me nervous. So I'm, I'm gonna share, uh, I'll start off with, um, I'll read two poems. I'll start off with a newer one. Um, so I've been working on visual poems. I'm really interested in, like in work that actually uh, maybe can't be read out loud. Um, or can't be read out loud in its entirety. So I'm gonna try screen sharing. So this is, this is a poem um, about the Central Park jogger case. I'm really interested in the way that objectivity uh, gets conflated with the white imagination. So this is called Angles of Incidents. The body is a haunt and non-Euclidean. Parallel paths will meet. Is a tree growing down the block? Is it the moon to you? Is the other side dark and small as the trouble it would take? And if you could, what might you? And what does it take to turn an angle to a blade? K prime, R prime, Y prime, A prime, K prime, 84th and 5th, C, nothing, a jog, an epiphany, a walk, Trisha Miley, Sparrow's Eye, a holy name, by 110th and 5th, Antron McRae, Kevin Richardson, Raymond Santana, 
Yusuf Salam, Corey Wise. And then I will close with, um, with a poem from my book. Uh, it's called Heliocentric. It's one of, my, one of the love poems. And it has uh, the epigraph, if I beg and pray you to set me free, then bind me more tightly still, Homer. I'm striving to be a better astronaut, but consider where I'm coming from, the exosphere, a desk where the bluest air thins to a lip, impossible to know the difference from where I sit and space. I promise I still dream of coming back to you, settling on your yellow for the kitchen, and we won't fight, not in this manifest, not over the crumpled bodies of laundry. We won't row over the nail polish, its color, the spilled sun. Inspiration is the deadliest radiation. It never completely leaves the bones. You know. From here, there are no obstructions, but the radiant nothingness. An aurora borealis opens like a fish. This, to the pyramids, yes, to a great wall. And there you are, moving from curtain to curtain. Oh, to fantasize of having chosen some design with you. But the moon's over Jupiter, but asteroids like gods deadened by the weight of waiting. I remember you said pastel for the cabinet where the spice rack lives, that I ought have picked you up flowers when I had a chance. Daisy, iris, sun, red roses, ultraviolet, the color of love. What else but this startles the air open like an egg. I'm really trying to be better to commit to memory the old songs about the ground, to better sense your latitudes, see the corona of your face, take your light as it arrives. Earth is heavenly too, but know that time is precious here, how wine waits years and years to peak. What is there to do? I've made love to satellites in your name. I'm saying I don't know when I'll return. Remember me, for here are dragons and the primitive song of sirens, stars that sway a legion, ships that will not moor, lovers who are filled with blood and nothing further. Who could love you like this? Who else will sow you in the stars? Who better knows your gravity and goes otherwise to catastrophe? I've schemed and promised to bring you back a ring from Saturn. But a week passes or doesn't manage. Everything steers impossible against the boundless curb of light. Believe I tried for you against space. Time takes almost everything away. To you, for you, a toast to everything incredible. I almost wish I'd never seen the sky when always there was you. Sincerely. Thank you. What a beautiful way to end this reading with a love letter. And also, I, the way that you just presented that Black math, I, I wonder if, I just wonder if we were, would to have understood math as being part of our lived experiences, if we would have understood it a little bit better these days, because there's certainly much math to what's happening. It's a bittersweet ending. I wish we could continue with this reading. Um, we've gone a bit over time and out of respect for the next presenters, um, I want to go ahead and wrap this up. And I'll do so by thanking each of our readers again. My spirit has certainly been filled. And if you all have been following the chat, there is a lot of activity and energy and appreciation for the reading that happened today. I hope that the students for whom this this reading was designed, got a good experience or got a good understanding of the diversity of poetry and 
um, a lovely first introduction to Black poets who are contributing to the ever-changing poetry canon. I remember fashion and uh, removing a luchador's mask and black love and the definitions of hunger and Eva ate dynamite good. Eva ate dynamite good. I remember the whites of knees and throwing the master's language back at the master's face and math. Math and math and these, these pieces will stick with me for the remainder of the year and into the next year. Um, luckily, the work lives on the page and you'll be able to access many of the poems that you heard, uh, that you, yes, that you heard today at either your library or your bookstore. Please go back to the chat and pick up links to those books. Um, I wanna thank Natalie, Dr. Graham again for inviting us and wanna congratulate Natalie and her team on the inauguration of the Institute for Black Intellectual Institute for Black Intellectual Innovations, IBII. Congratulations and well-deserved. If all of the readers can once again turn on their cameras so that we can say farewell to your real faces, I would appreciate it. Thank you all again so, so much. It was a joy to see you. You fill my heart when I put you in my pockets. Keep you Thank you, Natalie and Ashaki. Thank you. Thank you, Natalie and Ashaki. Thank, Thank you all so you. much. <laughs> this was fun. Mm -hmm. I got to be next week. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to do this every Thursday from now on. This whole, this whole, this whole day. Right. <laughs> Including my schedule. Natalie, that's a good lipstick, by the way. Very good lipstick. It's held. It's really held. You guys, that was fantastic. I am pleased, I am proud, I am impressed, I am broke from buying all the books, but I'm happy about it. I'm happy about that. 